Our message title this morning is uh, The Wisdom of a Godly Woman. This being Mother's Day, I, I felt like uh, focus should be on, on godly mothers, on godly women. And so today, um, as I was reading, I, I, I came across this woman, and I want to uh, present her to you today through the pages of Scripture. She's found in the Old Testament, and I want to look at this woman who showed great wisdom in protecting not only her own husband from certain death, but also protected the future king from the dead weight of remorse, protected him from doing something that would overshadow him the remainder of his life, that would affect his, his, uh, his life and, and really what God had put him here on this earth to do. And if you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25 in your Bibles, and I trust that you have your Bibles today, and I trust that you have uh, a notepad to write on today uh, to take some notes, um, I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel in the 25th chapter, and here you'll find the story of David and a very self-centered man named Nabal. There's a stark contrast between these guys. And in verse 1, I, I, I realize I've only named guys at this time, but we'll get to the, you know, you got to get through the brawn before you get to the beauty, amen? And so if you'll trust me and just bear with me for a moment. In verse 1 here of chapter 25, there we, we have here the death of Samuel. Samuel was the spiritual leader of Israel. He had served both prophet as both prophet, rather, and judge to the people. Now, remember that Samuel was the last person to serve as a judge of Israel. His life and his death closed the era of the judges and prepared the way for the monarchy, uh, 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 the rule of the kings. Amen? So more than anyone else, Samuel's faith and his courage had helped the Israelites begin the movement toward a united nation, toward undergoing a, a, a literally a transition from 12 disunified tribes to a unified monarchy. Amen? So the remainder of this chapter is a sharp contrast between a harsh, selfish man and a very wise and courageous woman. The picture painted of the man whose name is Nabal is that of a cold, mean person who was selfish and dishonest. On the other hand, we have the picture painted of a woman that is of a gentle, intelligent, understanding, wise, courageous, humble, and literally and figuratively a beautiful person. Turn with me to chapter 25, verse 2, and let's read through verse 11. Now, there was a man, there, there was a man in Maon, whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man is Nabal, and the name of his wife is Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. And when David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men and said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you. Peace to your house and peace to all that you have. Now I've heard that you have shearers. Your shepherds were with us and we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men and they will tell you. 
Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David and waited. Then Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my sharers and give it to the men when I do not know where they are from? Really what we have here is, uh, uh, the picture is that, that, that Nabal's sheep shearers, his, his, his shepherds, all of his flocks, all of his sheep, all of his goats, everything that he had, had been out in the wilderness for all these, all these weeks and months, and David and his men had protected them against the marauders, uh, uh, you know, against the, uh, the Bedouins, against all the, the bandits that literally were out there. And, and it was customary that when, uh, when, when strangers came by, you just fed them, you took care of them regardless of, of the number of them. And it was really uh, a, a debt that Nabal were, would, to, would have paid had he been thinking in his right mind, but, but we'll, we'll find out that that's not Nabal. <laughs> that's not his way. Nabal rude, rudely refused David's request to feed his 600 men. See, if we sympathize with Nabal, it's because our customs are different than the customs of that day. First, simple hosp hospitality demanded in that day that travelers, any number of them, be fed. David was, was presenting about 600 guys. Here's the, here's the reality. Nabal was very rich and could have easily afforded to meet David's request. Second thing, David wasn't asking for a handout. It's not like David just come upon them and said, hey, you guys are cooking food. How about throwing us a steak? That's not what was happening here. David wasn't asking for a handout. He and his men had been protecting Nabal's entire workforce. And, and part of Nabal's prosperity was due to David's vigilance. It was due to the protection that David had provided for all those that were working to cause Nabal to prosper. It was because of the protection of David. Um, any man with 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats could easily spare a few animals to feed 600 men who had really, literally risked their own lives to guard part of his wealth. David's expectation was indeed logical. Common courtesy would certainly dictate that Nabal invite David and his men to share his food at a festive season when hospitality was the order of the day. In those days when it was shearing time, it, it wasn't, I mean, it was a lot of work. It was hard work to shear all those sheep, but, but the focus, the, the, it, it was a time of, of festivity. It was a time of, of celebration. It was a joyous time where they came together, and it was, it was literally, would be the perfect time for this man Nabal to share uh, uh, with those that had literally been protecting him and to invite them to take part in the celebration. It was just common courtesy that would dictate that Nabal invite David and his men to share his food at this festive season when hospitality again was the order of the day. It would be easy to feed 600 men or rather, it would not be easy to feed 600 men in, in the wilderness. So David, again, sends his 10 young men to explain the situation and asked to be invited to the feast. But Nabal refuses to listen. The character of Nabal in the scripture is described as a churlish, as churlish rather, and evil, which the NIV translates surly, 
and mean and the New Living Translate uh, New Living Testament translates mean and dishonest in all of his dealings. He's mean and he's dishonest. Not in a few things, but literally in all of his doings. And when the young men graciously present their case, Nabal rails on them. I mean, he just jumps on them. And, and the, the, the NIV again translates hurled insults at them. The Hebrew word describes literally the shrieking of a bird of prey as it swoops down to tear its victim. Do you get the picture that's being painted here? I mean, it's pretty vivid. It's pretty graphic. Nabal compares David to a rebellious servant who has abandoned his master. He's making reference to the relationship between David and Saul. And, he, and he's, he's accusing David of abandoning and running from his master, which we know is not the case at all. But David... And Nabal compares him to a rebellious servant. It's obvious that Nabal's sympathies lay with Saul and not with David, which is another evidence that he had no heart for spiritual matters, but his wife did. And that's important for us to remember. It's important for us to understand that, there's, that Nabal had nothing to do with God, but his wife certainly did. So the young men then report Nabal's reply to David, who immediately becomes angry and, and swore revenge on him. So David, it's interesting that David could forgive Saul, who literally wanted to kill him. But he couldn't forgive Nabal, who only refused to feed, uh, uh, to feed him and his men. Now listen. How many of you understand that, when, that there are times in our life where, where things just begin to pile up? Things just begin to add up. Things just compound one thing on another. And finally, you know what? I've had it. And we just lash out. We just explode. That's what's going on with David. I mean, David's been running from Saul. He's been hanging out in caves. He's been doing all this kind of stuff. He's now got these 600 men that, that have uh, uh, abandoned not only Saul, but, but have came and, and, and gathered around uh, David. And, and David is, is, you know, protected these guys' sheep and all this stuff. And, and David just, all he says, you know, it's a pretty simple request, man. You've got, you are like a gazillionaire of the day. And certainly, you ought to be able to spare five or six of your, your sheep to feed my guys that have literally risked their life to protect your prosperity and to see to it that you prosper even more. And Nabal's like, no, I am not going to do it. Not going to do it. So David, David's just fired up. Nabal is ungrateful and he's selfish. But those are not capital crimes. Saul was envious and consumed with the desire to kill an innocent man. David's anger literally got the best of him. Has it ever gotten the best of you? It certainly has gotten the best of me from time to time. David did not stop to consult the Lord. How many of you say, yep, that's, pro that's my problem too. I didn't stop in the midst of all that was going on and say, hey, God. Hello? I mean, God. What we could avert if we would just stop long enough to say, God. What would you have me do? The, it, it, see, David didn't stop to consult the Lord. He rushed out to do what? To satisfy, to satisfy his passion for revenge. You ever had one of those moments where you, you finally, I mean, it finally tops out? And all this that you've been putting down, everything has been, I mean, it's been just welling up inside of you. And finally, it, the, 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 what is it, the straw that broke the camel's back? And all of a sudden, all of that gets unleashed on this. Amen? I mean, it really wasn't that big of a deal, probably, but it was the thing that put you over the top, and now you're just letting it all hang out. 
I mean, you are just going buck wild, and that's what's going on here. David, uh, David rushed to satisfy his passion for revenge. Had David succeeded, he would have committed a terrible sin. He would have done great damage to his character and his and to his career. But I'm telling you this morning, the Lord compassionately and mercifully stepped in and stopped David. Listen, sometimes people will get between you and your situation and say, hey, you need to just, <laughs> you need to chill out. <laughs> you need to take a break. You need to just calm down. But you want to just push them aside because you've got, you've got something to do. And so we try and push them aside. David didn't do that. And, we're, and, and, and it's a good thing. They, had he succeeded, he would have committed this terrible sin. See, God's servants, you and I need to be on guard at all times lest the enemy suddenly attack and conquer you. we got to be ready all the time because I promise you, the enemy is out there. The enemy wants to get you. The enemy wants to derail you. The enemy wants to mess with your ministry. The enemy wants to mess with your life. The enemy wants to mess with your family. But listen, that and, and some of us guys have a hard time listening to our women. I guess I shouldn't say women. I should say woman, right? Because us guys should listen to our woman, not our women, because we have a woman, not some women. <laughs> Amen? Oh, glory. Help me preach this, would you? <laughs> Hallelujah. My goodness, I can get myself in some trouble now. Good Lord. We need to listen. We need to listen. And I, I confess, I am not good at listening sometimes. Sometimes I just want to, I just want to push my way on and do my thing. I know what I'm doing, bless God. Amen. Mm. Yes. First Peter 5 and 8 says, Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Listen, if he finds a weak spot in you, if he finds a weak spot in you, he's coming for you. And he's going to just keep, he's just going to keep picking away at you and picking away at you and picking away at you until he gets you in the place where David found himself over the top. And now I'm going to go down there and David says, listen, if there's one of them left alive, when I get done, let the Lord do the same to me. I mean, he's fired up. He can kill everybody. There's nobody going to be left alive. David was really a godly man. He was a gifted leader. But listen to this, church. Listen. The best of men are but men at their best. Do you hear what I just said? The best of men are but men at their best. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we're just men. When the Lord isn't allowed to rule our lives, sometimes he steps in and overrules, but not always. But not always, but sometimes he does. Thank God that he did in this situation. When the Lord isn't allowed to rule our lives, sometimes he just steps in and he overrules. He saw that David was about to act rashly and foolishly, so he arranges for a, a wise and a courageous woman to stop him. Now, we're talking about David. Amen? We're talking about David. What is one thing that for sure has got David in trouble before? Can we all say it together? A beautiful woman. A beautiful woman got David in big trouble. Here, a beautiful woman 
catches David's attention and stops him from messing things up completely. It, it, this is one time in David's life where he got it right. Listen, when, when this anonymous young man reports his master's actions to Abigail, one of those from, uh, from, from Nabal's uh, uh, Shepherds and shearers was there and overheard the conversation between David's men and Nabal's men and Nabal, and, and, and he uh, slips away and he runs back and he tells Nabal's wife, Abigail. So this anonymous young man reports to his, master, his master's actions to Abigail. He was literally serving the Lord, but he didn't even realize it. He knew that he couldn't talk to Nabal about anything. Verse 17 if you read it there in chapter 25 you'll find out that nobody could tell Nabal anything hallelujah now he wouldn't listen to nobody so he immediately went to his mistress who was a wise and a prudent woman so the servant reported how David and his men had protected their shepherds and their flocks and how Nabal refused to repay them. He refused to just allow them to come and to eat and to celebrate and to be in this festive environment with the shearers of that day, and, and Nabal refused it. And so he reported it to, to her, and uh, he reported how they had been protected. Abigail... Nabal's wife, Abigail, demonstrated unusual intelligence. She demonstrated unusual understanding and unusual wisdom. Her courage is seen in what she was about to do, which was to go against the decision of her husband to not help David. She completely overruled her husband. It was not heard of of the day. In the day, a woman did not do that. Whatever he said, that was it. And especially a guy like Nabal that you couldn't talk to anyway. But the, but the Lord, by how, whatever means, I don't know, the Holy Spirit, whatever, but, but some way or another communicated, I believe, uh, to, to Abigail that, listen, if you don't intervene, your husband and all of your sons, everything that you uh, hold dear to you is going to be destroyed because of the ignorance and the, and the lack of compassion that your husband has. And so Abigail steps up. She made the courageous decision to go out alone and to attempt a reconciliation with a fugitive, David, a fugitive whom she was almost certain would be seeking vengeance against her husband, herself, and her entire household. This is, this is extraordinary bravery. She understood the crisis, and she had the internal um, boldness and the courage necessary to meet a cr the crisis head on. There was a crisis coming. There was a storm brewing. There was, there was death and, and bloodshed beyond uh, anything she had probably ever seen or experienced just down the road. She immediately made preparation uh, according to 1 Samuel 25 verses 18 through 20. She immediately made preparation and she took a quick journey to meet David. She had ge a, a generous supply of provisions packed and loaded on donkeys. Listen, she had all, I mean, this guy was extremely wealthy. So remember, and she just told servants do this, that, and something else. They loaded these donkeys down with all kinds of provisions vision wisely she then sent her servants on ahead of her so that the first thing that David saw would be the provision amen the first thing David saw was the bounty the provision what 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 he had literally had asked for uh, at the onset of this this chapter her hope was that by seeing the provisions that he might soften, that it might soften his anger and make reconciliation a little easier to achieve. So David stops to hear what Abigail has to say. 
he, he, he stopped. I mean, she was beautiful. And, and he was like, I believe I'll just stop and see what this woman has to say. I mean, after all, look at the provision that, that she's also sent. So David stops to hear what she had to say. Had he ignored her, he would have in fact been guilty of taking vengeance into his own hands. How many of you understand today that, that that's not scriptural? The Lord said, vengeance is mine. He'll take care of it. So David stopped to hear what she had to say. No matter, mm, this, this, this is hard to, to even say, let alone live out sometimes. But no matter how right we think we are, we must always be careful to just stop and listen to others. Probably nobody but me needs that today, but I sure do. See, the extra time and effort, it can save you and I pain and trouble in the long run. If we would just stop and listen to what somebody else has to say. Listen, somebody else has a different perspective on what you're seeing. Somebody else has a different take on it, different insight. In the words of one of the greatest storytellers of our day, a guy named Max Lucado, he said this, Abigail's no fool. She knows the importance of the moment. She stands as the final barrier between her family and certain death. She falls at David's feet. She issues a plea worthy of a paragraph in the scriptures. 1 Samuel 25 and 24 says this. She fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. She doesn't defend Nabal, but she agrees that he's a scoundrel. She, I mean, she's married to the guy. She knows what kind of dude this guy is. And she agrees that he is, in fact, a scoundrel. She begs not for justice, but, in fact, for forgiveness. She accepts the blame when she deserves none of it. 1 Samuel 25 and 28 says, Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord. Notice in your, in your Bible, there's big L's and little L's. Amen? When she's referring to David, it's little L Lord. When she's referring to the Lord of Lords, it's big L Lord. Amen? I just want to point that out because it's, it's, it's uh, what's being communicated here. So, um, please forgive the trespass of your maidservant for the Lord, big L, will certainly take care, or, or will certainly make for my Lord, little L, an enduring house because my Lord, little L, fights the battles of the Lord, big L, and evil is not found in, your, in you throughout your days. She's, she's making comparison between the Lord and David and that David fights for the Lord. And she offers the gifts from her house and urges David, to, probably some pretty good advice. She, she offers the gifts from her house and then urges David to leave Nabal to God. Leave Nabal to God and avoid the dead weight of remorse. Look at, at 1 Samuel verse 32 through 35 here in this 25th chapter. And David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advi advice, and blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hastened and come to meet me surely by morning, surely by morning light, no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. 
I mean, we're talking about uh, devastation being averted. I mean, David was, was upset, to say the least. He was going down there to, to, to make a slaughter. David returns to camp. Abigail returns to Nabal. Then when she returns to him, she finds him too drunk, even for conversation. So she waits for morning to tell him just how close David came to their camp and how close Nabal came to being dead at the hand of David. 1 Samuel 25, 37, and 38 says, So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became like a stone. We would, we would say that he is in a coma. Stroked out and had a coma. Then it came about, after about ten days, that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. See, when David learned of Nabal's death and now Abigail's sudden availability, he thanks God for the first and takes advantage of the second. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Listen. God had everything under control the whole time. And, and the important thing for us to understand, I think, today, is that we need to recognize that God has things in control. And if we will let God handle our circumstances, he will fight our battles for us, just like he did with Nabal. David, because of all of this, David gets a new wife, and Abigail gets a new home. Can I just tell you that it was meekness that saved the day? Abigail's gentleness re reversed a river of anger. David, David was about to unleash everything that he had been stuffing down in, inside of him for all this time that, that Saul's been chasing him. Everywhere he goes, Saul's just after him. Man, I mean, it's relentless. And this has all just been pushed down. David's had no release to, to, to let the anger out. And he was about to on Nabal and, his, uh, and, and all of his men. But I'm telling you, Abigail's gentleness reversed a river of anger. Humility has such power. There are apologies can disarm arguments. Contrition can defuse rage. Olive branches do more good than battle axes ever will. And by olive branches, we're talking about, we're talking about uh, um, peace. We're talking about expressions of peace. Abigail, if we would take the time, Abigail teaches so much. The contagious power of kindness, we learn from Abigail. The strength of a gentle heart, we learn from Abigail. Her greatest lesson, however, is to take our eyes from her beauty and set them on someone else's. She lifts our thoughts from a rural trail to a cross in Jerusalem. Abigail never knew Jesus. The truth is she lived a thousand years before his sacrifice. Nevertheless, her story prefigures his life. Abigail put herself between David and Nabal. Jesus placed himself between God and us. Abigail volunteered to be punished for Nabal's sins. Jesus allowed himself to be punished for your sins and mine. Abigail turned away the anger of David. And didn't Jesus shield us from the wrath of God? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, it says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. 
So who is a mediator but the one who stands in between? Abigail got in between uh, Nabal and David. Na Abigail literally stopped. She was the mediator. She stopped certain tragedy from coming. Nabal, <laughs> don't, don't misunderstand, Nabal got what he deserved. God saw to that. God took care of that. But David's hands were clean. Um, what did Jesus do but stand in between God's anger and our punishment? Christ intercepted the wrath of heaven. God treated his innocent son like the guilty human race. His holy one like a lying scoundrel and his Abigail like a Nabal. Christ lived the life that we could not live and took the punishment we could not take to offer the hope that we can't resist. Listen, I don't know what you're going through in your life today. I don't know what, what things there are that, that the enemy would like to use against you, but I, I can tell you today that there is a mediator that there's a man named Jesus Christ that, will, that will, will, will stand in the gap between what you and I deserve and what awaits us in heaven. We deserve what Nabal got. We deserve eternal punishment. But because Jesus stepped in the middle, because Jesus is our mediator, the Bible says that, that he is seated at the right hand of God and he's making intercession on your behalf and mine. He's our advocate with the Father. What the enemy says about us, uh, it may be true. We, maybe we are in some ways some kind of a scoundrel, but the reality is we've been washed in the blood. I'm no longer who I used to be. I've been born again. I've been washed in the blood. I, my mind has been renewed. It still gets out of whack every once in a while, but God brings me back into, into perfect harmony, into perfect order bet, be, before him. And Jesus is he's, he's my righteousness. And when God looks at me, he sees Christ because Christ is before me. He doesn't see all my mess because Jesus said, look, he's been washed in the blood. And so my record's been, is it expunged? Is that, is that the word? It's been washed away. It's been, it's, it's, it's canceled out. It's gone. I've been forgiven. I've been set free. Do I deserve death? Yes, I do. But what am I getting? I'm getting the, the riches of heaven. You know why? Because I'm now a joint heir with Jesus. Maybe you're out there today and maybe you're saying, well, preacher, how do you become a joint heir with Jesus? It's pretty simple. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, and you today, sir, you today, ma'am, Child, young, old alike, it doesn't matter. You are whosoever. I am whosoever. And God so loved the world that whosoever believeth on him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's you and I. And it's only, a, only, only available through Jesus Christ. He said this in another place. He said, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. And so today, if that's you out there, anywhere at all, whether you're alone or in a group, I can't see you raising your hand, so by faith I'm just trusting today that you're going to pray this prayer with me. And I promise you that if you pray this prayer and mean it with all of your heart and by faith believe that what you're praying is true, I promise you that God will come in and he'll save you and he'll redeem you. You know what it means to be redeemed? To be redeemed means to be purchased back. It means to be purchased back. The enemy has robbed you. The enemy has stole you. The enemy has caused you to go this way. But Jesus said, no, I'm going to pay the price of redemption. And he gave his blood on your behalf and on my behalf. So pray this prayer with me today, would you? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to be born again. I thank you for the opportunity 
to be forgiven of all of my sins. I believe that you love me, and I believe by faith that you'll now cleanse me and wash me with your blood, that all of my sins will be forgiven, that my name will be written down in the Lamb's book of life. And I believe that should I die or should you rapture your church, I will spend eternity with you in heaven. And today I'm grateful for that. Today I'm thankful for that. Write my name down and I'll serve you all the days of my life. And all God's people said amen and amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for being a part of, of our service here today. We're believing that very, very soon we're going to be able to come back together as a family, as a fellowship. We'll still continue to do the live feed uh, because we just believe that we're touching lives out there that we will probably never know about until we get to heaven. So we're going to continue to do this, but what, we're looking really looking forward to being together as a family. And, and, and so we're, we're grateful for your uh, coming and being a part of what we're doing here today. God bless you. Don't forget to to send your check or 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 give online however you choose to do it, but let God be a blessing and and help support uh, God's work around the world. God bless you. God go with you. Have a great day. We'll see you later.